good morning. I'm still at uh, uh, Fort Eben Emil. Um, today it's open on the inside. As you'd probably seen in the previous video, I took you around the outside of the uh, fort and show you all the uh, the, um, the positioning of these guns and um, all these casemates and um, rotating turrets and stuff like that. So we're going tonight, uh, today, and have a look at what's inside. But before we go in, I'll just go through uh, the stuff that I went through on the other previous video and a little bit of history about this place before we go inside. The fort was built between 1931 and 35, 1935. It's a consists of uh, four brand new forts from the Brailmont forts from the First World War. Um, the difference with these type of forts, so they're better heavily armoured, the, uh, the gun position was spread out so there couldn't be a concentration of fire. And the main thing is, it was actually They'd learned a lot about concrete since the Brailmont forts in 1881 and uh, these forts were actually reinforced with uh, uh, reinforced bar. In 1940 this was garrisoned by 1200 personnel run by a, a Major Jotrand. Uh, 200 would be staffed here, would be doctors, nurses, um, cooks, uh, engineers, just to keep the place running really. Then there was two sets of 500 soldiers um, one set would be here for a week and the other set of soldiers would be garrisoned very close by in a neighbouring village and they were taken in turns to garrison this. May the 10th 1940, just after the uh, Forney Wars they were called, Hitler sent over 13 gliders. Three gliders landed on the canal, the other side of this fort, and captured two major bridges. Uh, the rest of them landed on top of this uh, fort because it was so flat and wide. Uh, with about 75 soldiers and they used a new type of weapon called a shape charge. Placed them on top of some of these turrets and blew some big holes in and killed unfortunately some, some of the um, Belgian soldiers beneath it. Uh, no doubt a day of intense fighting and trying to hold off the uh, Germans. The Germans were too powerful. Uh, they were also helped by the Luftwaffe bombing the top as well as far as I know. And uh, just to keep the Belgians at bay and eventually on the 11th of May 1940 the uh, Belgians surrendered. Now, because of the surrender of this fort, which is one of the biggest forts on the, uh, uh, the Belgians had at the time, which is round about Liège and Maastricht, the Belgians were a bit uh, disheartened and uh, the Germans, with a superior power in the Brit Blitzkrieg, pushed back the Allies to Dunkirk and eventually 338,226 people uh, were evacuated to England. Right, let's go inside and have a look at uh, what's inside this building. For the first part of this video, we will look at the ground floor rooms and the everyday running of the fort. We will check out the defensive structure at the entrance to the fort and check out what's left of the DFS 230 gliders that landed on top of the structure way back in 1940. The second part will be the upper floors, which will include where the fort defences are coordinated. The VZ 175mm guns, the damage done by one of the hollow charges below the casemate of Maastricht 1 and the air gas filtration system to keep the troops safe from possible gas attack. It's the size of them doors are massive. There's a uh, crinelle as the French would call them, embrasure of the Germans and we call them loopholes. That'll be a machine gun. Wow. Right, let's go this way. In total, there's about four and a half kilometres of, um, of underground tunnels here, which is roughly about three miles. And all these tunnels are interlinked. They will take you to all the positioning above surface here. This is, looks like an air filtration system there. I'm assuming it's usually run by electric, but if uh, it's damaged at all then at least they've got a crank angle there to try and keep all the um, any of the fumes out of the actual building itself. This is where the museum have kept this as, a, as a, um, an intact artillery section there. Now I think the gun is probably 75 millimeter. Uh, I think the minimum they added was 60 millimeter. You can see how two men operated it uh, and then that bottom part's a shoot. So when the bullet so when the shell comes shooting back there it lands into that chute there and then drops down into a, no doubt a, an area 
down below whether they can actually rearm it or not with another shell. I'm not sure about that. Very similar to the stuff in the Atlantic, well, uh, sorry, the uh, Maginot Line. There's a machine gun, I think it's a Maxim machine gun. And they have a little, at the top there, I'm assuming that's some kind of optic so they can see outside, but otherwise they won't be able to. There's another man with a, a smaller machine gun. There's communications. Um, so they no doubt uh, they get um, a phone call if anybody was attacking them or they needed coordination. Size these doors. Got to be at least four inches thick. They're really heavy as well. Ugh. Wow, look at that. Lock the cells in so there's not much chance of the enemy getting to these, but the only problem with that is, yeah, you would lock them in. Two locks there. It's like, sir, I think this is a machine gun post looking at it. Um, the handle of that was probably be about 120 degrees, I'd say, looking at it. Now then, the gun muzzle would have gone through there, and this is the optic, if you can see that. This is what the um, Belgian soldiers had to look through. This is the observation section here. It'll lead straight up there, up there, to a coppola. You see, there's a periscope at the top, it looks like, well, anyway. And you see these, that area, that's a floor. The floor would have come down onto that ledge there, and then the man, the soldier could have uh, stood there, and I'd look round to see uh, if there's anybody uh, coming along who shouldn't be coming along. These here must be communication channels, looking at it. Coal powered. Yep. Well, the coal probably comes here for furnaces. I'm assuming the furnaces keep the place warm. This is what I'm assuming it's for anyway. No doubt it's um, sort of central heating. Uh, so the soldiers don't get cold. And obviously it keeps the condensation down as well. Well, this is uh, one of the engine rooms that kept the, um, the plant running. No doubt at a higher voltage, and then the voltage would be reduced as it went through the fort itself for different things. Unfortunately, I've not got a guidebook um, yet, unless I've not got to the entrance, believe it or not, where you're supposed to pay. But you go, you go quite into the quite a long way into the fort itself before. Um, I'm assuming you pay somewhere, but um, hopefully I can get some English and see what um, what I'm looking at really. I'm only going off the um, experience I've had with Maginot Line, which is very limited, but uh, it's very similar anywhere. <laughs> Magazine areas. It seems to be anywhere. Um, usually stored at the front of the fort anyway. Uh, the uh, munitions, wagons, they load them all up. They got wheels, they take them into the lift, then just carry them upstairs into the uh, artillery section, which is the top of the actual fort itself. Now these, looking at the brick, are the toilets. Oh, the showers, sorry. Quite a number of showers to keep the um, the personnel clean. I think next doors, what we saw before, maybe to heat the water for these um, showers. Good Hello. Hello, English. English, ah. yeah. Good morning. 
Good morning. <laughs> This looks like the original canteen. They've just done it up for a cafe, I think. Looking at it. Ah, there we go. And there's a bar down there, no doubt sells coffee. Yeah, I know what that is. That, that, that should have been an extractor fan. Uh, so all the, um, look at there, if you look at all them there, they've been under here. This is where they coop for the, um, the soldiers. There's usually probably minimum 200, maximum 1,200. Quite a number of groups here today. It looks like it anyway. I mean, you know, it's great to learn the history of the place. It's their own history, or the history, uh, which always interlinks us regarding the wars. Right, I think I'm going into the place where I'm supposed to sign and pay. Right, I've just booked, uh, I've just paid to come in, which is 10 euro, 2022 20, prices. Uh, I've also paid an extra 5 euros for a tour to get into places that I would normally get in on a, just a walking tour. Um, it's in Dutch and French, so obviously I won't understand what they're saying, but the main thing is, is I need to, at least I can get into the parks that um, I, I wouldn't be allowed on a normal walking tour like, uh, like I'm doing now. This place of the display area is actually the magazine, one of the magazine holders. Now what they normally do is when they store stuff in like this, uh, they weren't allowed any electricity in here. Well, imagine how loud they were because obviously a fear of spark and exploding everything. And well, obviously there's not much left here and there's lights in here now anyway. Um, the bench at the Great Belkin. This is one of the ventilation mortars. Uh, no doubt it goes to some um, ventilation um, filters that no doubt get sent, sent up uh, to the, um, there's two rooms up there that have got a filtration system in it and um, any noxious gases or dangerous gases gets filtered out and back out um, through, the, um, through the fort itself. Uh, this room is where the um, soldiers would have slept. Um, you can see all the clothes and that there. Uh, they've got to be, make sure that they're pristine and uh, so an officer comes round every 24 hours to make sure that everything's uh, in spick and span. These are the officers' rooms, 24 in total. But on the day of the 10th of May, when they were attacked, uh, there was um, three that couldn't make it into the, what do you call it, into the, uh, the battle. This is the chaplain, obviously, um, doing a confession. This is the officers' dining area. Uh, officers ate on the own, they didn't eat with the soldiers. Um, breakfast was something like five o'clock in summer and six o'clock in winter. And uh, the average soldier would pick up his dinner or breakfast or whatever it were from the canteen and go and heat somewhere else. This is the commander's um, office, Major Jotrand. Um, this is his office. Um, he commanded this place from the 10th, sorry, from uh, 1939, but on the 10th of May, when he found out that the Germans were attacking, he ordered the bridges over the canals to be destroyed. Unfortunately, Germans um, captured two bridges and one bridge was, I think, destroyed by the Belgians. Behind this glass is a DFS uh, 230 glider, German one, one of only three left in the world. Um, this was one of the um, one of the glass that landed on top of this fort here. The first bit here is actually original, that bit there, and the rest of it has been put together with the bits and pieces that were left from the actual glass that landed on top of this um, uh, this fortification, and put together with the coordination or cooperation between the uh, the Belgian and the German societies. If you can see underneath this glider, you'll notice that uh, it's got no wheels. The, them wheels are just for carting it around. There's got, it's like a sledge, so when it hits the floor, um, it's more than likely that's going to slow it down to sort to become to a stop so the uh, soldiers can get out. This glider couldn't take much weight. You see how narrow it is. It held about 10 soldiers, including the pilot. Um, but they didn't carry it with them shaped charges up to 50 kilogram. Um, the, um, these these um, were towed by, I think it were uh, Heinkels, I think it were Heinkel. And um, they were released about 25 kilometres or about 15 miles, something like that, away from the destination, which was uh, Fort Even a Mill, or the canal. This is a water pump. It pumps water, um, I'm assuming from the actual river, must filter it. 
and then send it up towards the, um, I think, the middle of the um, uh, barracks itself. And then it's filtered to every room or wherever needed. This is the infirmary. Um, see how many beds there is here. Yeah. There was, um, in time of war, I think there was uh, three doctors, uh, and there was nurses, and there was um, 19 stretcher bearers, because in wartime, you don't know how many... You don't know how many um, fatalities you're going to have or casualties you're going to have. This looks like a sterilisation room where they sterilise all the instruments to uh, less chance of passing any infections on. This is the operating room. And this looks like a dentist. This looks like a preserved section of the bridge that the uh, Belgians had blown up in time before the Germans captured the other two. This is a 50 kilo shaped charge, comes in two sections, when they're put together onto the target and the top little section, that little pointy up thing there is the ignition or the fuse and there's the, what do you call it, there's the 12.5 kilo shaped charge and that's the sort of damage this type of weapon can do. And this is a prison service, all the shits of the prisons. This is where they either get interned or they get released. I think punishment, depending on what it is, can range up from eight days, solitary confinement, up to 21 days. There's lots and lots of corridors off this, uh, and they've all got numbers on them, so as you're walking along you can pick up whichever you want. I'm assuming there might be a guide to it, but I didn't pick one up. But what you'll find is, if you're English, you've got English, you've got German, you've got Netherlands, you've got French. So at least you've got some slight information about what you're going to have a look at. I could turn the lift, but I decided to take the stairs instead. There's a load of them. It's very steep. And this is the um, command room where they do all the calculations regarding firing the guns and uh, how far where the um, enemy are. And uh, as I said, very similar to the Imagine Online stuff. So um, this is um, the uh, Command and Communication Centre. Looks like a communication centre for the outside world and probably linking to all the rest of the forts as well. Again, another communication centre. Um, as I said before, he's probably doing the calculations for the guns. May I split the, um, the gun sections into two, so they might be doing separate, for instance, the north side of the actual um, casemate, the actual um, bunker, and the other one maybe the south. Probably can't see me, but um, as I said before, this fort and the, and the forts of this era were, 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 were designed to some extent to the Maginot line. The Maginot line came a little bit later. So they were constantly improving stuff. This is on several levels where the Maginot line is mainly on one level. And then we go into the, uh, the sort of chambers, they go up into whatever it is, where it's communications or it's artillery. Or observation. As you can see, this is where the shells are stored. Uh, whether you can put one out or not. Oh yeah, you can, look, there you go. They've been full. Uh, they're in a trolley, just come from the uh, actual place where they're actually stored. And they're taken onto these um, elevators and taken up to the gun positioning. Normally in the lifts, the only people that can travel in the lifts is usually NCOs and officers. The average soldier, artillerist in this case, had to use the stairs. Are they here uh, a latrine or a... Well, the toilet, yeah. Well, the they have also uh, a lift Oh, hand crank, yeah. You can see them upstairs. This one is closed. Oh, is it? What does that lead to? Upstairs for the ammunition. Oh, right. Ah, because, right. Uh, the room upstairs is an over, over pressure. Yes. So they had to unload the, the, the muni there, munitions, yeah. With a little chart. You, uh, yeah. you bring it here and then it went up. Ah, right. It goes that way. You get you. The room and, and, and break. This has taken to the days of the Volkswagen is beschadigd. The other is uitgeschakeld. Door simple, a pistol mitrailleur, Vise, Vise 1, or Vis 1, as I called it. Uh, they have three 75mm guns here, and you can see there, this was the optics, they're not original, but they've put them back so you can see what they look like. And there's obviously the, uh, the what it is, that's the uh, elevation, or I should say the, uh, the uh, horizontal, to which way they need to point. 
Um, the corrugation here is so if the, it's been shelled and the pieces fall down, it doesn't break. Uh, it doesn't land on the soldiers. And that metal bar there is case they to take the gun out to have it repaired. That place there is where they get the shells from. They take, come up here and bring the shells out in the cases. And this place here is communication, as far as I think he said there. So they can tell if, for instance, um, if, for instance they're actually hitting the um, actual place itself. And that little box behind there is the overpressure system as well. I think that's overpressure. Over, overpressure? Pressure. Yeah, overpressure, yeah, yeah. So they can adjust it whichever they want. And there's a thing on the outside uh, where, they can, um, where they can release the, if it's too much overpressure. <laughs> this is the lift where they come up here and they uh, get, bring the ammunition. As I said before, um, if somebody would come up there, it's usually only NCOs and officers. Very rare. That actually does that. Um, the normal artillerists have to walk, so they have to be pretty fit to do that. That's another way of getting up to the top. If you want to go, uh, also, it's a quicker way. I hope you got all that what I was on about with the guns there. It's uh, difficult, the gentleman is trying to obviously, you know, keep to a timetable. Um, so I had a mini for trying to explain what I was looking at. On the 11th of May 1940, the Germans entered this fortification. On the 10th of May, they'd secured the top. They placed these hollow charges all the way around uh, this, um, this internal structure. And uh, I'm going to show you some of the damage what happened in one of the places they actually blew with just one of these hollow charges. So initially there was a door there. The hollow charge was placed just outside the door, it seems. When it went off, it, it shot the door off, blew the door off. It actually bent that pillar. It actually pushed that, the pressure, pushed that doorway that way. You turn round. That was a water container. That's what's left of the water container. And then the worst one for me is when the pressure went to the right, it ended up destroying this elevator shaft absolutely completely destroyed it. Look at the state. And that's just off one of these hollow charges. With all the charges they put in, quite a few of the um, so Belgian soldiers were, uh, were, were killed and injured. Uh, apparently in this room here, I think there was four soldiers that died and in mobile landing would have been an instantaneous. And then one of the walkways, which is going up towards the top, down there, another 100 metres that way. Um, it's a slope, you can, use this, you can use this slope, you can use the um, uh, stairs, or you can use an elevator. Uh, no doubt in them days, the elevators were exclusively for usually um, NCOs and officers, and the stairs were used for uh, the average soldier, and this no doubt for the average soldier as well. But you can see how far it is. For me, this um, fortification is very complicated. It must be easy to get lost in here. There's that many corridors and niches and stuff like that. Uh, that pipe there, straight out of there, it's going into there, it'll be all over the place. There'll be, there'll be exits like that, and that'll be for fresh air. It'll, it'll either push fresh out from the top. Uh, I think it was actually from the canal side, to be honest with you. There's less chance of the um, Germans, the enemy, going, uh, putting any grenades or anything like that on his side. There are putting the poison gas, and where it filtered through, and then it will come here as fresh air, and no doubt uses over pressure as well. Now, over pressure systems, basically, it just so if the Germans had threw anything like um, gas, mustard gas, especially in the First World War, uh, then the idea is it, there'd be more pressure on the inside uh, of this building, um, so it'll force the, any, any sort of noxious gases or anything that could do you any harm back out through where it came from. This um, section here is explaining the um, mainly about the attack on Fort Eben and Melv over the two days and a bit more probably history as well, history of the people that actually uh, attacked them. Um, I can't see anything in English, it looks as though it's probably in Belgian, which is usually French isn't it? But yeah, it's, it's French, um, so if you can't speak that language you won't, this room probably won't interest you. This place is a vast network of tunnels. It must be pretty easy to get lost, I think. Uh, not everything's accessible. Some's accessible where you can walk around, you pay 10 euros, you can walk around and have a look at uh, certain things if you can. Certain things like that are off limits and some things are off limits unless you do a guided tour. Now I did a guided tour, uh, so it could take me up to the actual uh, VIS-1, VIS-A-1 uh, gun emplacement, which I looked at outside yesterday. 
uh, and hopefully the video you, you'll see, I'll explain what goes on the inside. I had to be really quick with it because the, the guard wanted to switch the light off, so I had a minute to try and fit everything in. And when I turned around, he was ready for switching the light off, so. When you come into this, um, this um, underground fork system, you're about 60 metres below the actual gun turrets on top, and then different levels take you up to different heights. Uh, and then obviously the higher you go, the, you're going to go to the artillery side of things. Um, so, um, if you come in here and you, first of all, if you're not very good at walking, then it's not worth coming here because there's that many stairs, steps, there's some steep slopes and there is a lift you can get into. If you're in a wheelchair, you have no chance. And then when you get to the top where the, uh, the gun emplacements are, if, you, uh, uh, if you're not fit enough to get to the top, you're going to struggle, really are going to struggle. And um, so I think some of the stuff you can get to, dep depending on what your disability is, but a lot of it relies on you really being fairly fit. Um, as I said before, there is steps, there is slopes, and there's a, a lift taking you part way through, but it's enjoyable, and if you can book a guide, might be even better. But obviously, I'm English, so I don't know any other languages. You can uh, hopefully book uh, an English guy, but I think it has to be personal. Um, so it may cost you even more. But everybody in, in these uh, working here, just like in England and probably most places, um, they're all volunteers. I met two lads there, one calls Joseph or something like that, I think his name was. And um, he was learning how to be a guide. So the two gentlemen, uh, which I'll put a picture on, uh, of uh, what we're talking to, they were really good. They were trying to explain as best they can what this, this, this I think he was a Dutch guy, uh, was trying to explain to everybody else, but uh, obviously I had to get the gist of things. But generally I got the gist of things and I've just got to compare it with someone I've been before, which is the Maginot Line. Um, not much similarity, there's, there's, there is similarities, a lot of similarities, but personally I think the Maginot Line when it was designed was much easier to get around than places uh, like this. This is a filtration room. Um, all the, I th all the oxygen, uh, all the air coming from the outside of the fort, uh, gets filtered in this area. So, in other words, there's any noxious gases or dangerous gases like mustard gas from the First World War, didn't use any in the Second World War, gets filtered through here. Once the um, anything that's um, I presume heavier than her, then gets sent down to um, this massive hole. And it gets filtered away, and then the rest of the oxygen, the rest of fresh air gets filtered or gets sent through the actual fort itself. This is a memorial room for the soldiers that lost their lives. This room is depicting the soldiers that died on that day when the uh, Germans attacked. Uh, there was on total about 26 uh, fatalities and about eight, over 80 um, wounded. Could never forget the sacrifices that any soldier, any person of any war um, gives up their life for the freedom of others never ever forget. Well I hope you like the, um, some of the places I've been to inside this um, fortification and hopefully I've explained something that you can, um, you can relate to and if you ever decide to come here then I'll put a link on the actual site itself and see when you come inside there that at least you know what you're looking at anyway. Right thanks very much for watching and hopefully I'll see you on the next one.